lot. This is really cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, I would like to um, I would like to, first of all to thank my publisher, John Carlo, my publisher and friend, John Carlo D. Trapador. There he is right there. That's the New York Tiger. That's my man. I wouldn't be here without him. And uh, also, I'd like to quickly uh, thank a few other people. I want to thank Lauren Saran, our publicist. There she is in the lovely red dress. And Lauren Saran. Thank you. Um, I don't know if he's here tonight, but Eric Blair and also Shelton Wallsmith, who gave us our awesome cover, I want to acknowledge them. And um, a special welcome also to my family and friends, uh, my folks from work over here. And uh, too many people to acknowledge individually, but I see you all, and thank you so much for coming out. Um, also, uh, a man who needs no introduction, uh, Gordon Lish, my father. Uh, thank you for your support, Gordon. And uh, one last, uh, best for last, uh, my wife, the woman to whom the book is dedicated. Uh, one thing, if it takes a lot of patience to write a book, it takes even more patience to live with a guy writing a book. Thank you, Beth. All right, so as not to test your patience, let me get it started here. I'm going to read a little passage. This is where my main characters meet. Something was humming, barely at the level of hearing, and his head turned towards the sound. He took a step, concrete shards popping under the heel of his boot. The humming was electricity, he thought. He moved down the hallway past standpipes rising through the floor, the humming growing distinct. He went through a doorless doorway and began to see a fluorescent light. Then the hallway angled, and when he turned the corner, he saw someone. She was sitting on the fire stairs in tight threadbare jeans. She had work discolored hands, and her dark hair was in a ponytail, and he could see, the, see her thighs curve down to where she sat. A muscle ran up the side of her neck from her collar to her jaw. The brim of her hat tilted up, and she looked at him. Hey, he said. She watched him coming towards her. I'm cool. I just took a wrong turn. You get lost, she said. He came a little closer. Yeah, I got lost. She had not taken her eyes off him. At first, she had thought he was a cop. Now she was examining his camouflage. You are army? He glanced at himself. Yeah, I just got out. I was down south until a couple days ago. I just got here. It's my first time in New York. She listened to this, put a lock of hair behind her ear. You live here? I live, she asked. Yeah, you. Do you live? He pointed at the ground. Here. New York? Yes, I live New York. You like it? Yes, good. It's supposed to be a good place to party. Party? You know, like beers, jamming out to music, whatever, just partying. He sang da 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 and did a little goof off dance. I like, she smiled. This is very good. Their eyes met and they looked away. He took his cigarettes out. You smoke? No. Good girl, huh? I am runner. Runner? Like running? Yes, runner. Why'd you want to know if I was in the army, Skinner asked. Why? Why, I ask? Yeah, why? Because in my family, we are the army. You were in the army? What army? Not I am, my father. In the people's liberation of China. My father is the sergeant. No way. Is that why you're strong? You look strong. Strong, yes. She stood up and stepped forward into a deep lunge. Every day I am doing running, gymnastic, like this one. And she dipped up and down, touching her knee to the floor. Skinner watched her legs flexing. I do many of them. And, um, yang wo tui. What? Yang wo tui, she said. Push it, like this one. And she mimed doing push-ups. Most girls can't do them. Yes, I can do. I don't know. I have to see this. I show you. She got down, brushed concrete shards away from her hands, and hooked one foot behind her ankle. Skinner gazed at her cell phone outlined in the back pocket of her jeans. She did a perfect push-up, then she took a breath and did a series of them. Wow, he said. She got up smiling, dusting off her hands. Ten, she said. 
That was awesome. Please, she said, stepping back with a sweeping gesture, offering him the floor. Who, me? Yes, your push, please. How many you want, he asked, pulling off his camouflage. Oh, 100. In China, army boys can do 100. If you will be better than them, maybe I think 120. Is that all? He got down and started pushing. She watched the nape of his erect, short-cropped head, the ridged plates of his shoulders going together and apart, his kinetic energy as he threw his body up and down. He counted off in a rapid, mild voice. Her eyes went from the star on his neck down to the fulcrum of his boots. In the center of his spine, his shirt was getting damp. He paused with his tattooed arms locked out and his triceps twitching, sucked there and kept going. His neck turned red. He kept his voice even as he counted off the hard ones. Finally, he grunted at his back bend and he came up slowly. 50 okay? <laughs> ah. You are good. She gave him the thumbs up. I don't know, used to be. Yes, strong, very strong, she said. It's nothing great. She felt his arm. He flexed for her and she gripped his muscle. You have Chinese word? He pulled his sleeve up and showed her. It says, no pain, no gain. Can you read it? Is that what it says? Something's like this, she said. Want to try this, he asked, pointing at his chest. Soberly, she felt his chest. How about you? You show me? <laughs> yes, she flexed her bicep for him. They both looked at her bicep as he felt it through her long underwear shirt. What about the leg? Leg? Okay. She took a step forward with a bent knee, and he placed his large hand on her thigh. Man, he sighed. She let him slide his hand around her, her hip. Good, she asked. She flexed for him. Damn. After a second, she hipped away. Skinner stared after her. I go to work now. You have to go? Yes, I go. He grabbed his camouflage off the stairs and hurried after her. She led them back through the derelict hallway and pushed out through the fire door. Hey, wait! Zole slowed for him. I want to ask you something, Skinner said. I couldn't be more thrilled to be here, uh, obviously. Atticus's book is by far one of the best books I've read in the last few years. Those who know me know I read a lot and don't generally pull punches. Um, it has just great inner balance and beauty, and, and really I urge all of you uh, regardless of what you, you think of me, to buy this book. It's excellent. I, I heard today it's already gone into a second printing, which is no small thing for an indie book. Okay, real quick, we're going to get started, and I want to focus on uh, Zole and Skinner. For those of you who haven't read the book, uh, for all practical purposes, it almost has a dual protagonist, at least in the sense that... Uh, you know, we start with Zole and move on to Skinner, and it sort of alternates back and forth for a bit uh, whenever they're not in scene together. Um, yeah, I think the dual, dual protagonist of it is great. That, at the heart of the story, uh, it really begins and ends with Zole, and I admire her strength. Uh, so often when we see women, especially written by men, uh, they're being come in you know, someone's coming in to rescue them. Uh, she's as strong as it gets, you know. She's like Katniss Everdeen for, like, the real world. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, why she was the right protagonist for this book and the strength you uh, imbued within her. Uh, I'd like to answer that, too. Uh, because, for me, <laughs> because for me, um, I, I did want to make the protagonist female, I think it immediately ramps up the, uh, the, the, your nervousness for the main character, your concern for her. There's a different, um, there's, there's a safety concern for women that wouldn't be there for men, you know, basically you're worried about sexual assault, and um, especially in that she's a, uh, an immigrant, she's an illegal immigrant. Uh, she's part of a vulnerable population. You have a woman who's in jail, as she was, or a woman who's being smuggled uh, from the United States into, um, excuse me, from Asia to the United States or anywhere. Uh, you know, I read a book by Joseph Wambach called Lines and Shadows, which is about 
uh, people getting smuggled across the frontier from Mexico uh, into the United States. And of course, the people smugglers who do this, the coyotes, routinely prey on um, uh, the, their, the people that they also claim to serve. So especially if you're a, a woman in that context, you're uh, highly at risk. That was one element. And I thought, as strong as she may be, place her as strong as she is in a difficult situation where she's highly at risk, automatically it's gonna be more compelling for the readers. So that was a big consideration. The other thing was, is, you know, there are strong women in the world, as you all must know, and they're exciting characters to watch. I mean, I'm a big fight fan, and I, I watch the UFC a lot. Right now, it's really exciting for me to see Ronda Rousey in there, to see uh, Misha Tate. You know, it's tough. It's fun to see a tough girl. And so I was, I, I think that was another reason why I chose her as, a, as a, the type of character she was. You know, one of the things, uh, while, while we're on the subject, <laughs> Um, that I don't think might be clear in every review I've read. Uh, Zoe is from China, but she's actually um, from the northwest corner and culturally would associate with being a Uyghur, which I think is the right pronunciation. I was up last night, you know, on dictionary.com hitting the little, you know, uh, volume button that's Uyghur, Uyghur, no Uyghur? You know, I don't know what that is, no Uyghur. <laughs> For, for the rest of us dummies in the room, can you sort of let us know uh, why this culture was the right one? You got it. And by the way, I, I was kind of a dummy too because I was calling Uyghurs Uyghurs until very recently. And um, possibly that's because in Chinese it's Weiwarzu. And so I got the Wei in my head. But it's Uyghur. That's how the Uyghurs pronounce it. The Uyghurs are a Turkic people. Um, you would think of them as... Uh, similar to Uzbeks, Te uh, Kyrgyz, uh, Kazakhs, course, yeah. people from Central Asia. <laughs> Follow my leg. Um, they, I, for example, all those languages are a little bit similar. So all the people of Central Asia, those Turkic peoples, have a lot in common. Their languages are similar and their ways are similar. So, um, but to answer specifically why I chose her to be who she was, I can answer it best this way. You know, think of the Four Corners area. You're, you think of a, a place where somebody can stand in one spot and be four different things. To me, that's what Central Asia represents. It's a crossroads. Um, and so there were, there were many different directions that this character could uh, go in just by being from that part of the world. I saw, first of all, that she was a cowboy or a cowgirl. I saw her as somebody who's free, somebody where she says, don't fence me in. She's a Westerner. Uh, the West of China has something very similar to our West, um, that idea of independence, uh, being a pioneer, and self-reliance. So I thought she would have that characteristic, and that was important to me, especially because she was going to be incarcerated. <laughs> uh, that's the type of person who will probably prefer to die than to be locked up. So for dramatic reasons, I thought that's where she has to be from. But there are two other factors as well. Also, she's Islamic. Uh, at least the Uyghurs are um, a Sunni Muslim people. So what you have sort of dangling in the book, hovering in the book, is the possibility of jihad, given current global affairs. So you never know. Is that the direction that she might go? Her identity is, is going to be determined throughout the book. We're going to find out. So that was a question mark I wanted to be there. Now, uh, and then I would say a third element is there is the proximity to Siberia. She's not just a cowboy, she's actually an Indian too. The Siberians are shamans, they're shapeshifters, they go on spirit quests. Uh, to me, this was a more uh, true dimension of her character than the, the Islam. I felt that at bottom, she's somebody who's going to go on a long walk and that walk will possibly be a walk to the land of the dead. That's kind of how I thought of her. So I wanted all of those things wrapped up into one, and that's why I chose her to be a Uyghur. Yeah, I like that answer. You know, I actually was born in the Four Corners area up You're there. You're kidding me. Yeah, the first, the first song I ever learned to sing with was Jesus Love me and, Loves Me in Navajo. You know, yeah. Yeah, I grew up in Fort, uh, Fort Wingate, New Mexico, and then immediately went to Oklahoma, where I picked up the accent and the hat. You know? um, which you wear well. Thank you, I appreciate that. You know, you don't get enough compliments from men, you know, these days. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, well, one of the things, you know, we better jump real quick. We're, we're trying to make this short. I want to talk a little bit about Skinner. You know, Skinner has grown up in Pennsylvania. He, he's gone on three tours in the Middle East. He's seen a lot. Uh, there are hints throughout the book that perhaps he's suffering from PTSD uh, or TBI, traumatic brain injury, of course. Uh, though, though I think you wisely decide not to, to define it and make that a focal point. But you could, could you tell me why uh, he was the right fit for Zole, you know, in creating the book and creating the art for the book? Well, what I started off by doing was thinking about where the book was going at the end. The end of the book occurred to me before the beginning, and I kind of asked myself, if there's going to be a violent conclusion, if there's going to be a news story, who are the people who are going to be in that news story? And I kind of ran the film back in my head from there. Now, I've been hearing a lot about guys coming back from the war and uh, committing crimes on base. Uh, military bases are violent places, even in peacetime. Um, you know, back in uh, my brief military service, I, there was a very gruesome crime that occurred on Camp Lejeune just as I was getting out. Uh, a guy went down to the kettle and uh, said, I'm a nice guy with a gun, and took the money in the register and then took a ride with a cab driver who he then put in the trunk of the car and he burned the car and committed a homicide. And I heard about this. Uh, right as I was getting out, turned out that this person was in my battalion. So I think somewhere deep down I was kicking around in the back of my head, but in the front of my mind were all these stories about returning vets, and you were hearing about the social cost of the war. People went off, and uh, a percentage of those people who had been in, in the war uh, came back as um, uh, wrecked in some way or another, and uh, this is a story we're all very familiar with but uh, it became uh, a point of obsession for me. And so that is where I uh, was led to a character like Skinner. As far as some of the other demographics, I just wanted to make him ordinary. I didn't want to make him a super soldier. I didn't want him to be a Navy SEAL. I didn't want him to be you know, the worst guy. I didn't want him to be a bum either. You know, I, um, I read a book called Black Hearts, which is a, a piece of investigative journalism about a, an atrocity that was committed in Iraq. And some of the, and one of the main figures who uh, committed that crime was a kid who was sick from the very beginning, a real criminal kid who was going to be bad news even in civilian life. I didn't see Skinner that way. I saw him as a, as a, as a pretty ordinary guy who just ran, uh, who, who had his life destroyed because of the war. And that was why I chose him to be in the army, not the Marines. I chose, you know, I wanted, I wanted to. Um, uh, to make everything about him as unremarkable as I could, and uh, and some research went into that too. We we took a trip out to you know to Pittsburgh to Shaler and you know went to the town out there and just uh, tried to get a feel for it. But that's where he came from. Well, in terms of research, that's another thing I wanted to touch upon. I was telling you up in the, in the green room, which probably isn't as fancy as some of the other green rooms you hear about, but. Uh, I was talking. Not fancy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they gave me all the wine I wanted, and that's all I care about. You know, but, uh, I know that you did a lot of actual book research in making this, but I also know you did a lot of legs on the ground research. I was telling you upstairs that I went to go see, you know, East Egg and West Egg up in Long Island, and as I was making the trip back down. I just finished reading your book and I drove by some of the places and I was like, oh, I, you know, I recognize that. It's sort of like after I finished Cosmopolis, I was on 47th Street and a white limo, you know, cruised on by, you know. It's crazy. Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about the Absolutely. research you did? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and by the way, I, I'm still tripped out because you said that when you came back, you saw Club Juve, yeah. which is this out of the way place out in uh, St. Albans or Jamaica that I happened to walk by. But, um, and, and it is mentioned in the book. Uh, just in the scenery. Um, so uh, the research for the book was I tried to, uh, obviously there were many things that I researched be, um, using book sources, I, not secondary sources, but you know, I couldn't go there. I didn't go to Iraq. Some people do. I didn't do it. I didn't uh, go actually see a war. There are journalists who do it. I didn't do any of that. I didn't even go to a real prison and try to talk to real prisoners. So there, there were limits to how much research I did do. Um, but I did whatever I could at hand, and that would include, uh, I went to a sweatshop, I went to a couple of sweatshops in Brooklyn. Um, I, I um, 
I went to uh, uh, actual restaurants where I imagine someone like Zole would work, uh, out in the Flushing Mall, uh, down in the basement of some of these um, uh, kind of hole-in-the-wall uh, food courts that are tucked away in Flushing off of Main Street. I, I went down there and, uh, and sculpted those out. Uh, I did a lot of stuff in the various Chinatowns. I went into uh, grocery stores and made lists of products, uh, Chinese uh, grocery stores. and um, I, uh, Let's see, what else? Um, I, I also, uh, and then I picked things up too. Uh, one thing that would come up is a uh, target of opportunity, so run into things. Uh, in the Atlanta airport, I had the good fortune to speak to a soldier. There are a lot of uh, military personnel coming through the Atlanta airport, and I had a great conversation with uh, one young man, Beth was there, and we talked to him, and he was generous enough to spend a few minutes with us, and I got a term from him. I got the expression, turn and burn. I used that. He was a truck driver, and he would be with convoys, and he said, I had to hurry when I did an unload, and I would turn and burn. And so, I, you know, you can't make that up. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I was reading the New York Times review of your book, which was very positive. If, you're, if you want to know whether you should read the book, read that review. Excellent review. But one of the things it said, and I don't want to get it wrong, is it called your novel, quote, perhaps the finest and most unsentimental love story of the new decade, end quote. You know, there's no denying that at the heart of your novel there is a love story, but in some ways I almost feel as if... Uh, you know, this diminishes it to the average reader who hasn't picked it up yet. It's almost saying, oh, you know, Moby Dick is something about whales. You know, and I know it doesn't have, you know, Moby Dick has a great breadth and hundreds of pages, so it's sort of a different thing. But I think one of the things as a writer I most admired about your book was your sense of balance and proportion. Uh, you know, so much about art is uh, being able to cut away that which uh, sort of isn't in the case. And I wondered if you could talk to me about what that process was about finding the balance so it didn't just come across like another boy-girl book. Well, I had trouble with the boy-girl aspect of the book. I, I realized for myself I wouldn't want to read a long book about people's relationships. I, I just wouldn't want to read that. So um, I, I, I struggled with this side of it. I finally decided to check out Flaubert's Madame Bovary because Madame Bovary because I figured it would be a good example of uh, the same, a similar, uh, roughly similar type of story that I was doing about a, a woman who has a romance that ultimately um, goes bad. And so uh, by studying Flaubert, I, I learned what for somebody else might have been obvious, which is that you do need other stuff going on. And I got that from the other things that were happening in my main character's lives. So that was, it, it wasn't, I needed those things for dramatic reasons to balance the book, just as you're saying. So what's, what she was doing at work provided me another theme to go back to, um, to take the camera off her and Skinner all the time, uh, so it wouldn't be just resting on the two of them staring at each other all the time. So I had her work and I had um, uh, other things that were going on with him, and that was the role that I played structurally. Yeah, I think so much of the time uh, people make the mistake of not having that other element that helps give everything the dimension that it needs. And a yeah, variety. Yeah, all right. Needs some variety, needs some dimension. And if I'm not the one, you know, having the sex, I don't care about the boy girl relationship after a while. You well. should. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. So so anyway, uh, on to other subjects. You know, <laughs> you know, the book talks right, you're right. Yeah. Right. You know, it's, yeah, you, you get so bored, you know. I mean, how many times have, have I been in a, a workshop where someone's writing about, you know, their cheesy, pathetic college relationship, and, you know, I don't care. I have other things to do. <laughs> um, you know, the book talks a lot about America post-9-11. You know, you and I did an interview a while back in which we were able to discuss this in length for a while. And I loved what you said, because the book really touches on a lot of things. It touches on detention and extraordinary rendition, uh, and a lot of the things that have resulted uh, from the, Patri the Patriot Act, which sounds so nice until you see how it's played out ten years later. Uh, could you talk about why it was so important to you that uh, this be one of the overriding thing the themes throughout the book? Absolutely. Uh, this was one of the reasons I wrote the book. I was distressed over the direction I felt our country was taking, and that angst is what drove me to want to write the book. It came out in the writing of this book. Uh, I took it, uh, I, I would, 
I was upset from the beginning when this country declared war in Iraq. I remember hearing the hearings when I was going off to my night job. I would hear uh, Colin Powell in the congressional hearings uh, making the case that we had to go into Iraq and uh, lay, you know, laying the foundation for that. I remember thinking that this is wrong at the time, and I feel that everything that I've uh, read since then, that I've heard since then, has backed up that view. Um, I, so I was, uh, I, I, and I was also distressed over the Patriot Act, which I think is the right word for that is Orwellian. I think this country has made uh, changes that are uh, frightening. We have our war on drugs, we have our war on terror, and both of those uh, take, put a lot of people in jail who shouldn't be in jail, and that's what's scary to me. So um, that's actually really why I kind of wrote the book. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, at a certain point in the book, uh, a prime character comes into play. You know, we have Skinner, of course, who's uh, returning from war, and then he runs into another character as a result of the house he's living in. He, he runs into uh, Jimmy, who's just come out of uh, the penitentiary. And I wondered, in, in reading your book, uh, you know, whether you saw, you know, maybe crime uh, and war as maybe two sides of an Orwellian coin, you know, to borrow you, you know, your term, and whether, you know, how you see these things playing throughout the course of the novel and maybe just in everyday life. Absolutely. I, yeah, I do see crime and war, or rather crime and prisons, I see as two aspects of, of, of an authoritarian regime. I mean, you know, that is uh, the, the power of the state. We're going to go make war in other countries and we're going to lock up a lot of people. So there's, there's an authoritarian um, aspect there. But war and crime are also related in another way. Uh, I feel that uh, based on things that I've read, war unleashes crime. Uh, that idea is not original with me. I've, I've read Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Chris Hedges, um, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. Uh, these ideas uh, pop up in a lot of the literature on war. And they, um, so, so I was uh, definitely looking at that. Uh, I would say that the difference between Jimmy, Jimmy and Skinner is that Skinner is not a bad guy fundamentally, but Jimmy is. Jimmy's a bad scene. Now, I, I, I may be against the Iraq War, but I'm also pro death penalty for you know guys like Jimmy. You know, it's I I do believe that the state doesn't have a monopoly on evil. I think there are evil people who walk around, and Jimmy is one of them, and and that's why he's um, not the same as Skinner. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to ask you about uh, was sort of the way because you know whenever you read the book, there's a lot of darkness in the book, but I think the difference between uh, your book and a lot of books, uh, maybe somewhat like it, is that you also bring a lot of light into your book. You know, I mean, it's very easy to say death is always in the case, but I feel like whenever you explore that dyad, it really opens up the possibility for life and uh, sort of what the stuff of life really is about. Uh, you know, whenever you read the, the scenes of uh, Zole's homeland, I mean, they're just heartbreakingly beautiful and warm. Uh, and even though I know we've talked a little bit about balance already, I wonder uh, how you tried to manipulate that balance, how you knew when enough darkness was enough and, and you needed to peel it back a little bit. I think I could sum it up this way. I would say that unless there's something good uh, to lose, you don't worry about the loss later. So I, I felt for dramatic reasons, I had to show that there was something precious, something worth fighting for, and that that thing would then be in danger. That then failure would really hurt. So I, that was what was behind that. Yeah, I think a lot of these books that are written in that dark vein, it totally misses that. You know, if there's no light at the end of the tunnel, sometimes the reader quits going down the tunnel with you, you know. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm great with words. <laughs> yeah, I liked, you know, on one of the on one of the things that they did uh, to sort of promote this, it said authors Atticus Lish and Daniel Long. And I sort of wanted to be like, I'm really just sort of more of a dude who has a pen, you know, like, you know, he, he's an author, uh, but I'm glad to be up here. Um, you know, one thing I want to touch on, and maybe you will end at this because I know there will be questions from the audience. Uh, you know, you know, whenever we talked, you've worked a lot of, uh, you worked a lot of jobs, 
you know, I've worked a lot of jobs too. Some of them weren't very glamorous, you know. I remember reading uh, an article in Tin House by Jerry <coughs> Howard about how yeah. you know, over the last 20 years there's been this great dearth in working class fiction that, that, that anymore the working class writer really struggles to be able to uh, fit into a literary scene. And I wanted to talk to you because you know, throughout the book work is a big focal point. And I sort of want to know uh, your take on why that was important to you uh, because I really feel like it is a book that people outside of this very insular circle can pick up and enjoy. I couldn't agree more. I think work is exciting. You know, um, the one book that jumps out at me that talks about work is uh, The Glass Castle. Um, you, you know, when somebody has to be very enterprising, I, when that character is enterprising, when they're going out there in the classic American way and they're working at every job they can get and saving money, the reader gets engaged in that. You start putting money in that piggy bank along with them. Um, I love reading books about people who, who are working hard. Uh, I read uh, recently Unbroken, and make, making it into a movie. Unbroken is the story of Louis Zamperini, and uh, he um, was uh, shot down over the Pacific, and, uh, and he was an uh, Olympic runner also. But growing up, he was a hard scrabble kid in, in, uh, in California, and his story of growing up involves a huge amount of work from you know, working tons of different jobs and being enterprising and, 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 uh, and uh, so also from personal experience, uh, I used to run into guys who would tell me that they'd been welders and, uh, and I was like, you're too young to be a welder. You know, I mean, it's amazing people's work histories, uh, people who start really young, you know, they get parental permission to start working before <laughs> they're even legally allowed to. You know, my wife's a case in point. She's been a candy striper. She's uh, she's been working since she could possibly work, you know, uh, since before she could possibly work. And she, you know, so many people. So, uh, to me, as a as a reader, uh, I find that extremely engaging. Uh, I I would be uh, I'd be bored with a book with you know book without work. And uh, one final example that I do want to bring to your attention is Eugene Martin has managed to, I think he's a, this is the classic example of how you can make work fascinating. He opens a door to something that might sound trivial, like uh, locksmithing, and, and somehow he just turns it into something gritty and, uh, and amazing that you want to know more about. You get an inside view into it. So uh, that's what work can do for a story, and I wanted to try to use that. Yeah, it's such, such a good example. You know, Eugene Martin, such an excellent writer. You know, when you were talking about welding, it reminded me of when I was in school, like, I think when we were 11 or 12, they used to, one of our classes was welding. We'd go in and weld and weld. I remember two boys got into a fight, and they tried to weld each other, you know. <laughs> Not that that's how welding works. It's Classic. Yeah, 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 you know. Boys will be boys. Um, I know they, they do want to take some questions from the audience. Should we go ahead and open up for that? Okay. Are you a, a workout guy? Do you like to hit the gyms? No? Yeah, yeah, definitely love to hit the gym. Uh, it's a great way to unwind, for sure. Absolutely. I thought he was asking me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this man right here has got a serious athletic pedigree. Oklahoma football, baby. Yeah, that's true, that's true. When you sell the movie rights, are you going to write the screenplay too? And who do you want to play the movie parts? <laughs> I thought you already crossed that off. You know? I didn't even think about that. I have no idea how to answer that. So when I sorry. read that review today, that was the first thing I thought of. Well, I appreciate you thinking about it. I mean, believe me, it'd be great if there's a movie. I don't know. I don't know about that, that other stuff, though. I don't know who would play the parts. I don't know. I'll take suggestions. Yes, sir. Hey, the the scene where um, Zoe outruns Skinner seems really significant to the book. Um, her her spirit is so huge, right? And she she sort of lays him to waste there in that scene. Can you tell me something about what how how that came about? And what you were thinking about her <laughs> sort of defeating him in that way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you pretty much said it. I, I felt like, she, I feel as if she's a, she has purity of spirit. Uh, she's the one who believes uh, still. She hasn't given up. He's, he's nihilistic. He's, he's, everything's over for him. You know, he's heading towards death. We can feel that. 
And uh, meanwhile, she's staying fit, maintaining her fitness, and uh, it sounds like something Arnold would say. Yeah, you're maintaining fitness. You <laughs> need <laughs> positive life. No. Anyway, that's not what he was practicing that at the green room. <laughs> Who's next? So why do you shave your head? Uh, because I have green hair. <laughs> My hair is nasty. You don't want to say it. I'm doing you a favor. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> I, know, I know she does. I know. Believe me, I don't have the Fabio thing going. If I had the... I can't believe it's not butter hair. I grow the hair. I got no hair to grow, folks. Best I got. Ming, what's up? Hello, what's up? I, uh, um, my question is, I feel like every uh, book is somehow like autobiographical in some way. And um, I was wondering which character is most similar to you in the book. And... I kind of feel like Skinner and Zole are me split right in half. You know, uh, I definitely uh, see that I probably put a little of myself in each one. I mean, I had a lot of Zole's jobs. I did work in a Chinese restaurant, and, um, you know, and I, I sort of had a very, very brief military career, so I'm a full-fledged Skinner, but I mean, there's a little bit of, I, I kind of divided my brain in half for each one of them. So, to answer you, you were right on the money, actually. There's a, there's a little autobiography, but very little, because I didn't want to make the book about me, and um, yeah, I got outside myself for it. It's it's not all that much about me. I was working at the Chinese restaurant. I was. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I, I enjoy. It was um, Chinese fast food. It was at Wong's Boston, uh, at Downtown Crossing in Boston, and um, I loved it. <laughs> This guy, this shifty looking character. What's going on, Joey? What are you going to say? Hey. This is Joey Schwartzman, by the way. Joey, Joey Captain Morgan Schwartzman. How did you know when the book was done? When you were done writing? I actually didn't. I, I, I began the book with an ending in mind, and the ending is the one book, is where the book stops before the epilogue. I wrote the book up into that point. And then, uh, towards April of this, this year, uh, I had some talks with, with, with Beth, and we felt together, and it was, it was mainly it was Beth's idea that this is Zole's book, the book needs to end on her, it needs to end on her story. And so that's where the epilogue came from, and then I knew it was done. But thanks, man, that was a good question. Hey, what's up? What are the two characters that you picked for her name? Please pronounce it right. <laughs> okay. uh, I, you know, I would I would expect you to, to be strict with me. Because you've always been strict with me, and I, I've been kind of Americanizing it. It's, it's, you are Zhou. Uh -huh. You're not Zhou, uh -huh, uh -huh. And yes. I thought that was, yeah. yeah. Lei, I, da lei, da lei. Oh, okay, okay. That's what uh -huh. I mean. Not, not butterfly. Not flower. Okay. No, and in fact, that's that actually comes up in one of the scenes in the book where the guy says, "Is it flower bud lay?" And she says, "No, it's thunder lay." Okay. So, yeah. so you give her a very masculine name. Yeah, she's she's supposed to be a, a bit of a tomboy. Okay. Yeah. But if she's supposed to be a maker, how come she has a traditional Chinese name? Well, her dad is Han, so I get oh. I get to have it both ways. <laughs> <laughs> that I would enjoy and that Beth would enjoy. And, um, and for us, I wanted to worry and uh, fear and, um, and adventure. Th those things combined. And, and, uh, and um, what, what's the word when something, tragedy, you know, those things. Uh, 
it sounds bad when you list them all at once. It's like there's something wrong with me. But yes, <laughs> you would ask. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's great. I look out, I, I recognize a lot of people. Thank you guys for coming. You guys ready to drink? You want to go? Okay, ah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about chapter 42? No. <laughs> Is chapter 42 the assault? Yes. Well, out of, um, I, I mean, Okay, I, yeah. in, in chapter 42, for those of you who haven't read it, it includes a, an ugly assault. Um, and I, I, I would say that I'm interested in crime. I, um, and, I, and I wanted to show crime, uh, I believe, if, if you watch surveillance photo of a crime, photo, photography, film of a crime, uh, more often than not, I find that you get sickened by it. But most depictions of crime uh, in the movies uh, don't actually sicken me. I wanted to see if I could write something s s that would hit you the same way. Uh, that was what I set out to accomplish there. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> but I also wonder in that same moment whether you're deliberately using language that is not uh, sickening. The way you use the word improved he improved her is the most horrifying sentence I think in the entire book and yet it's so it's not you know describing how he struck her or how she bled or you know any of those things it's it's his thought it's his sick thought yeah it is it is disturbing um, so I, I did try to make it disturbing I really did I wanted to uh, make it um, disturbing for me and for any um, civilized person who would read it. Yeah, that's what I set out to do. Oh, I see another question here. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, the, the question is, did you study any psychological profiles for Jimmy? I'm so glad you asked that. I didn't really study them in this particular case, but I had been a huge fan of John Douglas, of Mindhunter, uh, if anything's ringing a bell here, like a, a, you know, Stan and Sane now inside the criminal mind. That's been sort of a side obsession of mine for a long time. I'm very interested in criminology for a long time. Thank you. I have hey. a really strange question. <laughs> Um, what fascinates you most about physical strength? Because there's a clear theme of that in this book. I haven't read the book, I just heard your little expert. <laughs> well, I think it's also what's out there. I mean, part of it is the military culture. Uh, and it wasn't just coming from me. It was. The, it, it's out there. It's in the gems, as we all know, and it's and it's in the culture of the army right now. I especially when I was reading books about the Abu Ghraib scandal. Uh, a journalist who um, in, in, went to Abu Ghraib uh, to the to the base to to see the people who were actually responsible for the um, the prisoner abuse scandal. I, the research he did turned up a fascination with lifting and with uh, supplements and, uh, and steroids. And it, this seems to be part of uh, the military culture. It's, it's also an American thing. It's, it's, it's this too muchness. It's this getting jacked up and getting enormous. I just saw a, a podcast yesterday. Uh, I watched the Joe Rogan podcast here and there, and he was talking about with the strength trainer, Mike Dolce, how in the 90s, people got even huger than ever before. You get these guys like Dorian Yates and, and bodybuilders who are just way bigger than guys like Arnold, and they're dying now. Their hearts are exploding from their overuse of steroids. So I see this as kind of a, a symptom of American excess. And, and uh, um, you know, you could, maybe it's sort of tied up to what's empty at the heart of consumer culture. You know, I, it does feel like it a little bit. Like, we're, you know, we're gonna fill it with something, I mean, really, what could be more shallow? At the same time, physical exercise has a spiritual uh, element or a, a kind of meaningfulness to me personally and to, I think, a lot of people. So it, it, it can cut both ways. I would say that's where my fascination is. Who else we got for you? Hey, what's up, Molly? How you doing? <laughs> Special recognition to Molly. Liz, thanks for coming out. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Who are the 
you think? Shall we drink? <laughs> <laughs> All right. If everybody's ready.